Azani, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? Uh, I'm good, man. Just uh, excited to, to talk to your audience. You know, it's been a minute we communicate, but finally we made it happen. Yeah, and we really appreciate the, the time. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you, my friend. So uh, thank you very much for coming on. Um, we wanted to kick off, I guess, with uh, the evolution of jiu-jitsu because you're widely considered, obviously, one of the goats of jiu-jitsu. I think at this point, you've probably been training for about 33 years. Mm -hmm. um, been a black belt for the best part of 20 and, and obviously competed at the absolute highest level, winning multiple um, world titles. And in that time, we've obviously seen a, a rapid change in jiu-jitsu, uh, both in regard to rule sets, um, sort of technique style, and also attitudes as well. So I was interested to get your take on your observations of, of the evolution of jiu-jitsu from when you started to now. Um, you know, the, the evolution, you know, some people complain about the evolution, but for me, uh, technical development is always technical development, you know. Um, even even the practitioners, you know, you remember if you were a halfway to you were a big guy, you know, usually like ultra heavyweights were just, you know, sumo, guy, sumo looking guys, you know, now you see like, you know, Victor Hugo's and Bushesha's, you know, I think it's always doable. Um, I do think that the main thing that kind of jiu-jitsu stopped doing it was the idea of uh, self-defense, you know, particularly myself. I started jiu-jitsu in a time that uh, the whole jiu-jitsu versus luta livre uh, was very was very present with us. You know, the the the, the perspective and the and the possibility to go to the street and get into a fight that was very big. You know, there was a lot of like heat towards that. You know, so we, we train like that. You know, the the, the academies were just clubs you know there was no there was no organization really i remember the first uh, state championship in manaus which is the biggest jiu-jitsu place in brazil one mat you know like you, you <laughs> could compete in one mat the mat was made of canvas and uh and like wooden dry wooden you know so those there, there were great times you know there was no no technology uh a little bit who had like a VHS camera was rich. Uh, there was no such things as like looking at videos. Like if you wanted to train, you, you, you had to be in the Academy. You know what I mean? So uh, those are like very good times because we develop within ourselves. You know, that was very like club oriented. Oh, don't teach that technique. You know, this is our technique. Um, you know, so the information wasn't there. So I think the evolution came with the, I guess, with the evolution of information. You know, uh, I think in the beginning it was like Orkut and then MySpace and then people started like, oh, I want to post my fights. You know, I remember in social media, you know, watching people posting their fights. I'm like, why are you posting your fights? You're telling people what you're doing. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the, 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 the business of, you know, uh, DVDs, you know, and then information was out there, you know, and uh, as humans, we're very adaptable. You know, next thing I know, we're doing incredible things. We, we move in ways that, um, you know, like, but you're not supposed, your body not supposed to move this way. You know what I mean? And it's beautiful. For me, it's beautiful. Uh, it, it does take away a little bit from at least my sense of like, you know, take down, take people down, going for submission, um, be more position oriented, dominate the person, you know. But again, I I can't I can't really I can't express my my wish to jujitsu to be a little different. But you know, and like it, it's a lot of people that has some sort of like maybe um, a little bit of a, a limitation of what they can do. And they're going to win the way they can win. You know what I mean? Um, even this weekend at Worlds, a lot of people are complaining how, you know, the fights are shitty. Yeah, you know, you can say that people are using so much the rule set to win. Uh, that's for sure. You know, the idea, the feisty blood of like tribalism, you know, like tribal, you know, I'm going to beat your academy. It was a bit, was a bit more personal, you know, back in the day. Today, 
it's more of a sport and definitely uh, is, uh, be a little more focused on the, on the IBJJF, which is, you know, our, our main organization, which basically everyone copies their rule. I think their rules are terrible. Um, it, it's so much room for interpretation. Um, you know, like you watch, a, at least in my eyes, I watch a fight and for six minutes, the only thing they're trying to do is to sweep each other. You know what I mean? In my, in my concept, an attack is either a submission or, or attempt of a guard pass. You know, like you see guys that they, they, they hold the sleeves, they, they do lassos and they stop there. And you, you can clearly see that there's no intention for progression. You know, a guy that do like a, I don't even know how to call it, like squid guard or whatever from the one that you grab the lapel behind the leg, you know, like kind of, kind of like an omoplata. And then you make that grip and you don't do anything with it. You know, you just let, hang in there and there's no interpretation of intention. You know, I think that the rule should be more interpretative as far as intention. You know when someone wants to fight. You know when someone is looking for a submission. You don't see basic things such as like an arm lock attempt, a choke attempt. You know, you don't see those things because the sweeping, like, you know, the sweeping culture is way bigger than the submission culture. You know, I think those things that those are the ones that I think it hinders a little bit. But, uh, I think in a, in a, in a, in a, in a broad spectrum, it is a sport. Um, a lot of people, uh, when I ask the, the, the coordinators, what's their argument behind the rule? They don't even know. Like they go yeah. like, Oh, because it's to keep self defense. Oh, because Elio Gracie does this. Elio, like Carlo Gracie's wanted this. I'm like, as far as I know, Elio Gracie died saying that that wasn't his jitsu just to start. You know what I mean? I remember Ali Grace saying, this is not my jiu-jitsu anymore. My jiu-jitsu, there's no points. You know, so I think the argumentation for rules, they're, 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 a little, they're a little weird. But I don't think there's a perfect rule. You know, people say, ah, submission only. And you can see, you know, very bad submission only uh, fights, you know. So I think it depends a lot on the fighter, you know. But, but overall, I really love the evolution, you know, the creativity, you know, what can be done, you know, the professionalism that a lot of, of fighters do. And, and, and the main thing, I think, is the, is the, is the creation of a, a richer industry where, where people, you know, they can train, they can make money competing. Uh, people complain about pay, but the industry is still not that rich. Uh, you know, what can we do? You know, I think jiu -jitsu, people in jiu-jitsu are in a way rich because it's a very expensive sport. You know, from, you know, if you compete 10 tournaments a year, here you go, you know, at least 10 grand out of the pocket right there. You know, so it's not a cheap sport to compete on, but the industry is still not, you know, a soccer industry or football industry, you know. But I appreciate, you know, I appreciate the efforts of, of everyone. Um, you know, it's beautiful to see uh, where Jiu-Jitsu went and how, uh, you know, we can go to the street and be recognized as fighters. You know, that's that's pretty special. Yeah, yeah. There's there's lots to to kind of touch on there. I think, mate. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's good to hear that. I think you you see the I guess the benefit of the evolution for sure. I guess some of the arguable negatives might be around some of the tradition, um, and that you'll kind of see maybe sort of less of the tradition, less of the art. And it is more about sport and we're seeing a lot more nogi. I mean, do you, obviously you're, you, you've, you've always been a coach for many, many years and still are. I mean, do you still like to hold on to that tradition or is it, do you think it is moving in a direction now where it's becoming more of a combat sport rather than a martial art? Uh, where do you define tradition? Let me ask you, what, what do you define tradition? What is, what is tradition? Yeah, so I guess it's the, the attitude of the practitioners, the, the kind of respect for one another, whereas these days you tend to see a little bit more trash talk with social media. Oh, yeah, 100%. You know what I mean? Uh, it is still martial arts. You know what I mean? I think, I think um, people, I think like martial arts, has always been a tool to educate people outside of like a school, like, you know, a school environment. Like you go there to learn ge geography, history, mathematics, 
you know, um, and then people just treat jujitsu as just as it is, right? Like there's no, there's no order, you know, there's no things like this. So I think it's still martial arts. You know, I think the art in, I think in any training regiment, you know what I mean? Like, let's, let's, let's put martial arts outside. Let's talk about training regiment, right? You go to a professional basketball, like if you watch the last dance with Michael Jordan, that was like military, you know, Michael Jordan was an asshole, like a good asshole, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry the language. You know, he no, pushed no, people, yeah, yeah. He, requ- he required discipline, he required work ethic, he required, you know, proper attitude and, and in a lot of sports. Like literally every single sport, there is a level of commitment to a cultural approach to discipline. You know, I think in jiu-jitsu, discipline has gone to the gutter. You know, people just walk in the way they want. They dress what they want. They do what they want because it became a customer, a customer oriented art or sport or business by any sense. Let's just do what the customer wants, you know. And then if I make an analogy, when I go and talk about the rules, they just want to, oh, but people are complaining. I'm like, I don't care about people. This is ruining the fight system, you know. But anyway, let's go back to, to what we're talking. So. You know what I mean? It still requires a, a, a big amount of discipline and commitment and order, you know? So uh, in my school, for example, in, in the six blade systems, like, you know what I mean? Like we are, yeah, a jiu-jitsu school, which means a belt, a kimono, you know, you bow, you do formation, you you keep a great attitude, you know? It's not like like, like, like worshiping, you know what I mean? Like, oh my God, Sean is the sensei. I can't say anything. No, one, it, 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 it's respecting the place that you're learning a way to get better. You know, it, it's a dojo. It's a place to learn the way, you know. Uh, I am just a person that, that holds the knowledge to give it to people. And for their environment to prevail, it's required a certain a certain attitude, you know, a certain way to behave yourself, a certain way to 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 have an attitude towards it, to be able to give example to, to the other generations. You know, I think that's extremely important. You know, it's like an etiquette. You know what I mean? I remember back in the day, our parents would beat us up if we don't hold the, 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 the fork and the knife properly. Now that, that that has gone to the gutter, oh, let's just eat like this. Like, oh, uh, mate, don't uh, get me started with that. I had this argument with – I have this argument all the time because my wife eats the wrong way around. <laughs> and yeah. it, honestly, it winds me up. And now my boy started doing it, but he's 12 now. And when he's trying to cut stuff, he's, like, so awkward. And I'm like, swap your hands over and it will be easy. Do you know what I mean? And uh, it just – honestly, I'm with you there. <laughs> I'm with you. You know, just simple things. Like, let's say good morning. Like, sometimes I go around and I, I have a smile and I, and, I, and I just walk around to random people. Hey, good morning. And they look at me like, who is this idiot? You know? <laughs> so uh, I think that's what it is. You know, like we lost a little bit of that philosophical of that. But again, super fun. Let's let's talk shit. You know, like I said, I'm always, uh, I, I think I even joke too much. You know, I was even watching one of my seminars. I was like laughing. I was like, oh my God, man, I'm there to teach a seminar. But I talk so much. I'm laughing. I'm making jokes. And I'm supposed to be teaching jujitsu. <laughs> You know, it still has a lot of uh, space to fun, to maybe, you know, like like a, a more a loose environment. You know what I mean? Like people say, hey, should I call your master? Should I call me sensei? I'm like, look, just don't be an asshole. You know what I mean? <laughs> like inside the math, yes, I'm a sensei, which means teacher. It just means teacher in Japanese. This is what carries over. That's how I grew up. And that's the order that, that it is here. You know, and uh, I think if we look even the way the world is today, you know, the way the culture of the worlds are going without order, you know, mm-hmm. we are we are a species that kind of like we need some sort of a, a formality in our lives, you know, to maintain the discipline, you know, like the way we behave, the way we talk to each other, the way we have our manners on the table. I think is, this is extremely important. In martial arts, it is a tool to reinforce that, you know, to reinforce good manners, good people, behavior, and things like this. And we're not fixing people's behaviors, you know. We're not 
Well, it starts with with the teachers. Okay, well, I'm not going to just complain about the people that practice. There is definitely 70% of people that should not be teaching jiu-jitsu, that should not be running a martial art um, for, for, for numerous reasons. Uh, but, and that's, I think, where, 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 where we're going away from. You know, you want to talk a little bit of stuff, you know, like I'm going to beat you and things like this. Uh, but I think when it becomes very personal, especially in grappling, you know, because if you're going to respect me, and I cannot punch you in the face, that's unfair. And then becomes a, a civil problem. You know, with MMA, I get it. You know, you punch the guy. It's a bunch of gladiators. You know, at least if you call my mom ugly, I will have this chance to, as a man, to treat you as a man and fight you back. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to call my mom ugly and the worst I can do is choke you, it's unfair, you know, because even if you look back into the history, again, gi versus no gi, let's put this way, we didn't grapple. That was MMA, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? When Luta Livre and Jiu-Jitsu wanted to prove who's better, we didn't grapple. Mm-hmm. We, we, we fist fight because that's the real way to see who is more effective in, in a real situation. You know, so that's the only thing that really that really gets me when I see some people really disrespectful, like, you know, talking things that I think is a little bit above the edge. You know, I think that that that's a bit too much. You know, I like when people talk about the technique. Oh, your guard pass sucks. You know, go eat <laughs> some cookies. You know, I think when when, when kind of go that that way, uh, I think it's 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 OK. But like when you when you tell, you know, this Brazilian or. Or go back to your, you know, your poor country. I think that's that's what gets a little, a little more, you know, disrespectful. Um, I don't know, man. I, I think if I would be in today's, you know, competitor and a guy in grappling would disrespect me, I'll say I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll smack them. You know, I'll I'll find a way to create a fight because I think it's totally unfair if you as a man escalate a situation into a disrespect the next level after disrespect is violence mm-hmm. you know so, so so i think that that's what happens you know um you know if you go back to like even the situation with uh you know the two fighters from you know the, the super fight fighters for the moment that a guy pushed me in my chest he's escalating a situation and he's in a way giving me the the excuse to escalate to violence you know so i think that's that's what people are missing i think that the 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 uh you know i think that idea uh, we have a word in portuguese for this i don't know how to say in, in in english but but the sense of the sense of what's right or wrong is being very missed and i think martial arts is a great 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 tool for that and that's why i think i wouldn't say tradition i think i just say operations you know people have this idea about tradition i think like it's just the organization of our culture, I think I think should be maintained at least a level of discipline to keep people on their toes. Yeah, no, I agree, and I, th- and I think I think as far as general population goes, I think jujitsu practitioners and, and grapplers are still not bad. And I think you mentioned there about, I guess, the world we live in is moving in that direction as well, right? And yeah. I think I think at least with grappling and jujitsu, there is still some degree yeah, of respect. Yeah, yeah, but but if you like, yeah. like 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 I think like people polarize a lot what happens in a small box. Mm. You no, know, if you look at you know whatever Instagram flow grappling, it, it, it's just a handful of people, right? Yeah. If you look at this in a world of like look at BJJF, they have hundreds of thousands of of practitioners. You walk at worlds, you know it, it's. The, the thing that even give you goosebumps, man. The thing about the beautiful thing about jujitsu is that if a, if a jujitsu person recognizes you in the street, you have a home. You know, mm. you have a friend. You guys can talk. Uh, I remember sometimes I I'm I'm on the airport and and a guy come and talks to me and my daughter like, do you know him? I'm like, no, it's a jujitsu guy. Oh my god, the black <laughs> guys knew each other for years. You know, and and I think that's the beauty for the sport. You know, and, and I'm always going to have eyes. Uh, of course, I can come and analyze and make an analysis about things. But I think in, in, in a broader 
spectrum of the martial art itself, I think is still great. I think we are doing a good job. Unfortunately, what sells and clicks is the is the drama. You know what I mean? So unfortunately, that's what gets out mm. there. You know what I mean? And and, and unfortunately, that like the real jujitsu is still not broadcast. Um, you know, in a larger scale. Yeah, no, very true. It's definitely definitely a beautiful thing. And we've talked before on this podcast with many people about, yeah, exactly that. If you travel, and even now speaking to you, this is uh, you know this is incredible. But if you travel, you've you've got friends everywhere, right? So that's yeah. that's awesome. Well, if you if you if you have a gear, you're never cold. You're never like. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true. And uh, another thing as well, and you kind of touched on it a couple of points there. Just is obviously gi versus no gi, and. You know, you, you talk about a bit of uh, drama. We've obviously seen recently with with Craig Jones and his inv invitation on ADCC, and and obviously everything that's happening there, which is you know it seems to be for the the interest of the athletes in regard to pay. Are you are you kind of in the loop of what's been happening there, and do you have an opinion on it at all? Um, I, I think it, it's a good thing that he's doing just on the wrong purpose and, and timing. You know, I think uh, uh, I think going against ADCC is is going against twenty and some years of something that actually gave him the platform to do what he's doing. You know, he took very personal something that uh, I understand that you know you know Mo has promoted and doing things with this, but the ADCC is still the World Championships of grappling. You know what I mean? He's still it's like IBJJF. So basically what he's doing is, is if I would have gone and put a tournament the same day as the IBJJF World Championships and I just have a shitload of money and that's what I'm doing, right? Um, I think what he brought, it's a, it's a great thing in a sense of like, hey, let's open up the books, right? Let's, let's make something a little more clear, all right? Because sometimes... You negotiate with some, you know, with some people and say, oh, but you don't, you don't have viewers. I'm like, well, let me, let me see the numbers. You know, let's, let's open up with that. All right. I do understand that maybe ADCC could have maybe, you know, less production, maybe more money to the athletes, but ADCC has always treated the athletes right. You know, this is something that, um, you know, I think this is not correct to say. I understand that maybe the pay could be a little bit better, but the approach that was taken to the show was to make a bigger show, right? Like let's make this the greatest event in the world, but it's still a world championship. Like look at worlds. You pay to compete the worlds. you make money in the end. It makes no difference. You still a world champion. So I think he's hurting what a lot of people have fought and, and, and want to do. You know what I mean? And, and, and I understand some, you know, even one of my athletes, he decides to go, maybe I would have taken that shot. You know, um, Victor Hugo is a big draw. And I think if he does pay a million dollars, is a million dollars. Such a lot of money. It can, it. it can change. But I just think the way that he's been doing is something that I do not agree. I'm not, I'm not behind at all. You know what I mean? Like I said, he could have done a week later, uh, whatever, two weeks later, a month later, and set up a standard and make that. I think he would he would even benefit more if he has done after because he would have more world champions. You know what I mean? He would have got the track that this event would have brought, you know, the, the whole thing. And then it say, guys, understand you want to be a world champion, but these are the things we should be going. You know, I think it would have a better way to do it. And I cannot go behind the, 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 the strategy behind it. You know, like I said, I don't know. We don't know if this thing is going to continue. Uh, Craig Jones has no history of doing anything in the sport as far as organizing. Uh, it's very easy if you have a, a guy behind you that has a couple million dollars to waste. That, that's basically what it is. Right. And then if you look at ECC, um, I'm a business owner. Right. So if I am doing business, 
the least I can do with business is profit from it, right? So let's put it this way, right? I cannot just go and lose money because, oh, yeah, let's pay the fighters because they deserve. I get it. We all deserve. I've yeah. been there. I competed for 30 years of my life, and guess what? I probably spent over $2 million in all my competitions and everything, and I, and I didn't make that money, you know, because I paved the way to ADCC to be where it is right now. I didn't compete in this. Well, the first ADCC was because of staying grand, yes. But after that, because I wanted to be a champion. I wanted to prove myself as a badass motherfucker, you know. And that was the point of it, you know. But now it, it is a business. So let's put the perspective of the production, right? Let's see 2017, 2019, which I bitched the mode that the tournament looked like shit. And, and he tried to make a better looking event. I, I 100% think that he probably have lost money on those events. Guess what? Maybe this one, finally, I made some money. But at least, you know, the production was amazing. He set a standard. It's a show. Well, go win an Olympics. You make no money on the Olympics. You make no money in anything. And also, just like a, like a way to think, you should, so people are pretty spoiled. In a, in a sense of like, of like, we have a, such a rich industry, right? Compared to mixed martial arts, compared to judo, karate, anything. After boxing is grappling as, as, the, as, 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 as an opportunity in the combat sports. Maybe now bare knuckle. How many millionaire judokas do you see? Yeah. Zero. Karate, zero. Wrestling, zero. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't sell a wrestling DVD to make money off of BGG fanatics. You don't go to a wrestling competition to make 10 grand. You don't do that. You know, because any and, and, and it is a rich industry. Like, don't get me wrong, the like if you look at the wrestling NECAA, it's a it's a very rich sport where the colleges are behind it. You have people that graduate on whatever Penn State that donate millions of dollars. You know what I mean? There's a there's a bit of pride behind that. You know what I mean? And I think with jujitsu, I don't know where this came from. Where again, this is just a perspective. I I really appreciate everyone makes a little bit of money. You know what I mean? But you know, you see blue belts make money. You know what I mean? You see blue belts. People with like two years of jujitsu going to Abu Dhabi. And make a thousand dollars in a tournament and become a world champion in, in Abu Dhabi. You see kids, you know, being sponsored by these 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 big companies and and flying for free. So, like I said, when I look to other sports and look at jiu jitsu, I think we're doing we're doing okay. You know, yeah. we're doing very good in comparison to other people. Go be a blue belt in karate. <laughs> Do you think? Um with the athletes that are going to go over to Craig's, do you think ADCC will hold a bit of a grudge? Because my worry is that they'll do it for one year. All these guys will go over, and then next year, they'll when they put the invites out, they'll just say, you can get fucked, you can go and compete. Like, you're going to have to win trials to get there. Do you think they'll do that to everyone? Um, it, could, it could. It could be. Um, I think... Um, I think uh, you have to win shit to get invited. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I think, I don't know, as far as I know, what I know about, about you know, the, the team uh, right now is Mo. I'm not sure if he's going to do it again and whoever does it. Uh, I don't think so. I think they should just, I, I'm always, the thing about me, man, in my whole life in martial arts, I never come from a place of scarcity. I'm never going to do something to somebody just because they don't to me. You know what I mean? Um, I think people take their decisions uh, based on, like, even I had an argument with this friend uh, over, 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 over Instagram. Like, oh, loyalty. Da -da 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 -da. I say, look, what do you know about people's life where maybe they prefer guarantee $10,000 and a chance to win a million dollars, right? 
Um, maybe I would have a different approach on it. Depends on my position on the sport. Um, but I can't, like, like when Victor Hugo made a decision to go, right? I can't tell him, hey, no, go stay. I'm like, look, man, 260 fucking, 260 pounds, you're a big draw. But that, that could be consequences. You might just have to compete in a trial to get to the next event, you know? And I think it will be fair. Hey, you want to go in? I invited you. You, you, you. you actually make the tournament look shitty. Go in a trial. You know what I mean? And I think it's fair. I think it's fair. Ah, you want to come in again? You were up my list. You know what I mean? And now you just went to an event that it's a non-existent event. Nobody knows about it. But he walks around with a million dollars in cash. So that 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 says something. Right? We don't know where that money comes from. We don't know what the IRS is gonna do with that. I don't know if they're <laughs> yeah. competing, the FBI is <laughs> gonna walk in and this money for coming from a big you know, Russian, you know, Middle Eastern mafia. We don't know. You know what I mean? So shady business for shady business. I don't know. <laughs> Imagine you know that I mean? fucking happens though. That would be hilarious when it like fucking hell. It was just from some dodgy fucking, some mafia guy, some Russian oligarch. <laughs> yeah. Like I think when you, when you, when you have, you know, imagine if a guy gives me $5 million, hey, Sean, you do a tournament. I'm going to sit down like I know everything. Yeah, for the fighters. Yeah, let's do this. But my only problem is that ADCC started as, you know, a show for the sheiks in, in Abu Dhabi. And it turned out to be the biggest grappling event in the world. It's the world championships of grappling, right? Regardless of... Uh, Mo, regardless of how they use Gordon Ryan uh, for the for the things, regardless of that, I tell people you want to talk shit about Gordon, go beat him, you know, and that and that has always been my, my mantra, right? You know, you just gotta accept that the guy draws some people. Some people love or hate him. They dare to watch him. He's a great fighter. He brings people in. Yeah, today's his time. Tomorrow it isn't. Tomorrow is someone else. You know what I mean? But at least. We use some leverage to certain things to bring the sport to where it is, you know, and, and it's great, you know, that, that, that the tournament was supposed to be amazing. And I'm feeling hurt because I'm a Hall of Fame of the DCC. And I was supposed to like, yeah, put my my suit on and, and have all this. Now I feel like my speech want to be all different. You know what I mean? Yeah, guys, you know, I'm here getting my Hall of Fame, but, you know, there's a lot of bullshit going on. It's a fucking sucks for this sport today, but it is what it is. At least tomorrow we're gonna have a millionaire. You know what I mean? Like it just it just hinders. And then um, and now what about fifteen thousand people that bought tickets? Like you know what I mean? Oh yeah, the athletes. I'm like yeah. What about people that have spent two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars, five thousand dollars to make a trip to Las Vegas to a show that they're not watching anymore? You know what I mean? I don't even know if I'm the subject anymore here. You know, <laughs> yeah. just went on and on. So I think those things, um, you know, they really, they really, they really hinders it. And 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 like I said, I just don't like the strategy behind it. You know, mm-hmm. I think I think he could have allowing people to be world champions and 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 not creating this 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 decision that can hinder people's careers more than make it. You know, as far as I know. Three people gonna benefit from all of this, maybe four. Mm. Abby Garcia, mm-hmm. Craig Jones, and whoever makes a million dollars. I think in a in a in a way, everyone else is losing. Yeah, yeah. No, some really good points there, mate. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. I hope does great. Yeah. Every year, two times a year, we have a jiu-jitsu millionaire. Fucking awesome. Take me to dinner. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I do hope, like I said, my only thing is how he's tried to prove a point. Mm, yeah. And, and it makes me feel that we all pawns in a game. Mm. That we don't know really what's behind because there's no history behind. And that's the problem. That's my problem. But great. Next time I have to deal with full grappling, with a thing, I got my fight, eh? Let me see the metrics. 
Why don't you want to be clear about it? Great. He brought a really good thing. But the only free cheese, brother, is the mouse trap. You gotta remember that. It's so easy to get a metric when you have free on YouTube. You know, you could see people, you could literally have 15,000 people watching this, you see, on their phones, be on YouTube, watching the other show, which is okay. It's so easy when everything is free. You know what I mean? But now when you have to invest on it for the business, for whatever that is, then it's a different story. Then we see who really, really is willing to support something. You know, so there's always a way to think about it, you know? Mm, yeah, I guess time will time will show us. Time will show us, yeah. Yeah. And then I guess with, um, obviously with all this drama, with ADCC, with Craig Jones' inv invitation, it seems that obviously no gi grappling is getting quite a lot of traction and it feels like it's it's been moving that way for a while. I guess thinking about the, the sort of actual competition and, and everything else, you're obviously a person who competed and, and, you know, was a world champion in both gi and no gi. Do you feel like the athletes who just train exclusively no gi have an advantage over those that train in the gi as well um i think it all depends on the athlete you know look at look at Mika galvon for example the guy fought gi no gi a week from each other and did great uh i think it all depends from person to person i do think today because of you know it, it, it's about the reps right you look at Let's put new wave and B team, right? They practice 10,000 hours of one thing, you know? But then you have people that are hybrid. But, like, for example, my Jiu Jitsu, like with the Gi, if you take the Gi off, it's the same because people teach Jiu Jitsu with the grips. I teach Jiu Jitsu with positioning. Right where the grips are an add-on to my positioning, at least my approach. You know what I mean, and uh, and definitely timing for sure. I remember, um, like all the way up to 2015, uh, I only took my gi off two months before, you know, competing ECCs. Actually, every single tournament that I fought, you know, no gi. Um, I didn't have to 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 really spend too much time without the gi. At least myself, because my 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 jiu jitsu is not much dependable on grips anyway. You know, the only grip that matters is the grip on the collar. Everything else is for me makes no difference, right? The way I position myself, the way I smash people, um, just the way I do guard that I use the hand, the collar mostly which if you reproduce for no gi would be just the diamond frame. Um, but I, I remember 2017 when I fought Gordon and I fought Craig, um, I felt that my timing was a, was a, was an inch off. You know what I mean? I felt that those 5,000 hours that Gordon and Craig put ahead of me, uh, really made a difference because I remember I always get to a good position with Gordon and he always had the little a little thing to avoid my pass, especially when I was on top. You know what I mean? I was on top of him. I was able to get a couple half guards. Um, but he always had like some some sort of little little thing ahead of me that I felt that I didn't have a, like a lock on him. You know, and then um, of course when he got on top, you know, he put a lot of pressure. Even my guard, I was like, man, he's always a little bit ahead of me. Um, you know, until I was able to go underneath of him a little too early, he attacked my arm and I ended up on the top. Uh, with Craig was the same thing, you know, like Craig had, had like a little, even though I took him down and I beat him, um, I really, I beat, I beat Gordon too, but they raised his hand. So I'm not going to be, be, be sour about it. Um, I just felt that that was a little bit off, right? They're, they're so sticky. Even the guy that I fought, um, at the last ADCC, uh, I was very, I was very behind him, time wise. But I think my, my in my case, the timing wasn't there, wasn't bef because of training itself, because doing training I was doing really good. I think it's because I didn't compete enough no gi. So I don't think it's about the training itself, how much you train. But I think it's your timing, your timing applying that in competition. 
You know what I mean? It's a totally different ball game. Uh, my two re- my retirement tournaments, uh, if I had to go back, I would have done different. Uh, but I failed at that time. That was the timing for me to do the retirement. Um, on the room training, man, conditioning, I was smashing. I was, you know, the dog in, in, in the room. But once I got to the tournament, like they were in speed five and I was in speed two. You know, everything was off, you know, so there is that, there is that too. You know, so not just how much you train, but how much you can actually apply that in an actual environment of competition. Because competition is a totally different ball game. You know, uh, if you can train and compete, like, without without competing, like, as much and go to a high performance, you, you, you're probably outside of the box. You're not in the box, you know. But, uh, but yeah, I think there's a lot of factors. But uh, I think what's happening now there's a lot of hybrid hybrid athletes, you know, that they do gi and no gi for a long mm-hmm. time, yeah. and I think that doesn't hinder the, their their ability to go and and compete toe to toe with the with, with the no gi guys. Yeah, I guess some of the, the the main things you typically see, you mentioned obviously a little bit earlier about you know these these different lapel guards that that kind of can stifle people and, and create a bit of a stalemate. So I guess if you're a no gi competitor training in the gi you might run into that and, and maybe the leg locks i think coming from gi to no gi perhaps but but yeah i think you, you are seeing i think a lot of people doing both like you say yeah and i think i think i think in a way one complements the other right like sometimes when i want to do a technique uh, without the gi i'll put the gi on and i will use grips whatever that is so at least my body so our like you know there's a reason why our skin is our biggest organ, right? Everything we touch, everything we do turns into like the technology, you know what I mean, in data. You know, I think our skin absorbs a lot of data, right? The way our body moves, right? So sometimes uh there is a technique that I don't I I can never perform without the gi, right? But if I can recreate that in a gi environment and my body then now uh, starts to, in real situation, perform a certain movement, now my body goes like, well, I think I can do this. And then I go back to no gi. Next I know my body, it doesn't feel so alien, you know, to, to you know, to do a certain move, right? Or, or guard or guard pass or things like this. And, and it works the other way around because now without the gi, uh, even though they say it's a little more untechnical, uh, I think it's extremely technical as far as like the top game. I think the top game is very technical because your positioning and the way you manipulate the body structure has to be very, very precise and very positionally pre- precise. I remember when I started to do a lot of nogi, I would go back to gi, I'm like, oh shit, I'm already in this position. You know, now the, the grips are available Everything's available. So I make the, the grip available after positioning. I don't grip to get positioning. I think that's the number one uh, thing that people don't get it is that they use the grip before to achieve a positioning. When you should achieve the positioning to get a grip, you know what I mean? And you have to like kind of like, you know, balance that that equation over there, you know, because a lot of people, they can only pass your guard because they grab your knee, they grab your collar, uh, but without the gi, it's not going to work, you know? And I think the other way around, like, I think the no gi, we give you my, oh, I can, I can cup this way. I can grab the elbow that way, you know? And I think that when you add a little bit of a grip, it might not even the best thing. I tell my guys, I say, guys, there's a lot of techniques that you guys are using the gi that you shouldn't be using the gi. Use the elbow structure, use the framing, use the shoulder, you know, paw more versus gripping more, you know. So I think there's a lot of technical ways, technologies that we can we can play around. Again, we're very creative. You just got to be creative. Mm, yeah, some great advice there. I think, um, yeah, focusing on the position before the, before the grip. That's great advice. And then talk to us about mindset, because obviously, again, this is something you're well known for is, is your eye and mind. And we talked about obviously the the training and the repetitions and obviously the exposure to competition being key to success. 
What role does uh, does mindset play? Do you think? Um. Uh, I think mindset plays everything. Like like what they say, that the number one way to get to the moon is first believe you can get to the moon. You know, um, I have uh, even the work I did uh, for Worlds. You know, especially now that that you know I'm a coach more than anything, and I study a lot of leadership and how people uh, they they uh, how can I say they cheat themselves. There's a there's a cooler word for that, but I just going to cheat themselves in the way they think, okay? So, like, you have to to have a, dis- again, it goes back to discipline. I think mindset goes back to discipline. It, it always go back to discipline. You know, to have dedication, you got to have discipline. To have a good habit, you got to have discipline. So everything comes down to discipline. If there is one word and one thing that I would always want to be able to have everywhere in my life is discipline, right? So, um, it's make sure, first of all, whoever is underneath you, they believe in themselves. That's the number one thing. Why are you here? You know, um, one of my fighters fought for, for worlds, right? And I'm like, bro, like, why are you playing this jiu-jitsu? Oh, because I was afraid of this. I was like, you train with Victor Hugo. You know what I mean? Like, take that as a power, like me, I trim the best guy in the world and I kick his ass sometimes in training. Who is this guy? You know what I mean? So I think it's a practice. All right. So mindset's a practice. Okay. Uh, again, let's go back from outside of the box, inside the box. There's people that are just good. There's people that need works, you know, and he's like, why did you put the guy in 50, 50? You lost a chance to show your jujitsu for three minutes and gave the guy the chance to beat you. Oh, I don't know. I say, you need to know about it. But then the other day he's fighting the who's number one. And he's like, hey, man, man, I, I hope it doesn't go wrong June 20th. I'm like, why are you going from a perspective of negativity? Why don't you tell me, man, can't wait for June 20th to protect the house and beat this guy? You know, so I think mindset starts with the little things that you do. You know, everybody thinks it's this greater thing. You're going to read the book. Now I know everything about it. No, your body does not answer this way. You know, you have to convince yourself, has to go to your cells, have to go to your subconscious and have to be part of you. So it's a process. In my case, I had one of the greatest, toughest minds in the world, which is my brother, right? That guy, if there's pain involved, he's feeding from it. You know, he's that guy. You know, he's a, he, he bullied me. He, he, he made my mind like, because there's coaches and coaches, right? There's the guys that, yeah, the <laughs> man right there, you know, there's people that need to be like, oh my God, you're so good. You're going to do great. There are some guys like you're a piece of shit. You better fucking do it. You know? So there's a lot of like, uh, you know, variance on that. And I think it's important for us to know this. But the number one thing for me is just tricking the people to to have the mindset of abundancy, not scarcity. Okay, going back to even the way we think about jujitsu, right? You know, like right now that weekend at ECC is going to be just scarcity. We we all take it from one another. I want what you have. No, we all have. You know what I mean? So it starts from that. You know, I remember. Saulo was like, like even when I train with Saulo, for example, that's how I build my mindset. I'm like, man, if I can accomplish a technique 50%, like I almost got it, right? I could be like, man, I suck. I'm like, you know what? I'm training with Saulo. So I convinced myself that Saulo is a god. You know what I mean? Uh, but also, you know, the guy is so precise. is ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. Um, so I convinced myself that if I can almost accomplish a technique on Saulo, I can accomplish anything to anybody. And it worked, you know, I'll be like, oh my God, I'm already mounted on this guy, you know? So I always had that mentality, you know, and I knew he was, he was teaching me on the pressure. Like Saulo was never like, oh, bro, Gio, you're doing very good. No, like he would point your mistakes every single day because he, he, he demanded perfection. And I took that as a way of caring more of a way of like 
uh, you know, he's not saying I'm doing good because I need a positive enforcement. No, it's fucking martial arts. You know what I mean? If we're in a war and you have one mistake, pff, my head is off. And that's how we think. We don't take purple belts to war. We don't take a tough blue belt. We take a black belt that can finish. No boot scoopers, no lapel players. If I'm going to go to war, I want to make sure my black belt warrior by me is a vicious, savage finisher. You know what I mean? The, a brown belt four stripes, I don't take them to war. That means nothing if they, they can finish. So that's the mindset that I always had, you know, and I'm always like, well, I train the best in the world and, and, and that's it. And that carry over to my world championships. You know, I, I never had that plan to anyone that I fought, but Hoger. I convinced myself that Hoger was the Goliath I had to beat and everyone else, they're just tools on the way to the king. And that's how I, I lived every day. I train specific. I didn't train to anybody. I just put myself, of course, I trained for that, you know, and we can talk about, you know, training methods, whatever. But it's just like, you know what? If I am 100% sure I can beat Hoger, no one else beat me. And I lived that. And I walked in there, tournament, I pee on the corner. I'm the alpha dog in here. This is my territory. There's a big guy over there, and I'm going to beat his ass. And you guys are here just to make the show with me. And that's the mindset. You know what I mean? Of course, with a lot of respect, all right? We talk about mindset. I hope I'm not saying anything to disrespect anybody. And that's how, how, I, how strong I was. I say, I train my ass off. I'm trained. I'm positive and confident. The music is bombing. Everyone's watching me. It's just my show. And that's what I did. You know what I mean? And then when got to Hodge, and then, of course, uh, the gold of Jiu-Jitsu, I had to go and play strategy, and then I have to like have a plan with him. Everyone else, if I'm on the bottom, if I'm on the top, I could care less. I knew it was a matter of time until I got my position and I was going to finish them. You know what I mean? So that's basically how I discipline myself to think. You know what I mean? Certain little nudges. But like, like I said, every day, every day, every day is a little bit. And and I think what's happening, that's why the whole idea of toughness and mindset are really big today, because we have a generation that are so dependent on positive enforcement. You know what I mean? Like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? If you don't say they're beautiful at least once a day, <laughs> they, they become depressed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like, and I think that's the problem. You know, and then when hardship comes by, Oh, you know, where are the flowers? No, man. Look the hardship in the eye and say, I'm going to own you. You know what I mean? Like when it rains, you know, hug the fuck lightning, you know? And I think that's what it is. But it's a every day. Like, 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 for example, like it's nine o'clock in the morning here. I had to wake up, you know, a little bit earlier than like to, usually Friday is the day that I wake up a little later. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to talk to the boys. I'm going to wake up an hour earlier, even though I'm going to hinder my sleep. Why? Because I need my voice to be at least doable. Otherwise, I'd be like, what's up, guys? You know? <laughs> so it's a little victory. You know what I mean? For example, if you know me now, I love coffee. So I look forward to, I trick my mind into why do I wake up that early? Because I want to wake up. I want to smell the coffee. I want to grind the coffee. I want to do my little thing. Maybe I'll post something. It tricks it tricks your discipline, you know what I mean? And then you become your mindset strong. For example, one thing that I never do when I'm training, I never lay down on the floor. It doesn't matter how, how tired I am. I finish my training, I shut my mouth, tie my belt, and I stop. And I'm like this. I'm dying, but I'm like this. <laughs> because there's technology. I can breathe. I do breath work. So it creates, again, that strong mindset. The little victories. Do you finish your, your jiu-jitsu round? You throw yourself on the ground and open your gi, or you get on your knees, tie your gi, look to the camera, wink, get a nice picture for the Instagram. Whatever it takes you. You know what I mean? I think it's important. Like when people talk about going to the gym, for example. Oh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I want to I wanna work out because I want to be, be, be healthy. It's not because I want to look good. 
I'm like, well, that's very hard mindset. Why don't you first maybe, maybe want to lose one centimeter in your waist? It's okay to go from a perspective of vanity, let's put this way, to get in shape. And then it becomes a lifestyle. You know, people put the lifestyle before the everyday habit. You know, we, we have a saying that, right, there's 90 days to, to construct a habit. You know, you're not going to go one day, yeah, I wake up early every day. Well, let's see the second day. You're like, oh, fuck. You know, next thing I know, your body asks for it. You know what I mean? Right now, my body tells me, hey, brody, that little coffee tradition that you have, you know, and then I do it. So it, it, it's a process. You know, mindset's a process. Uh, it's little victories, right? The positive enforcement is the sense of the little sense of accomplishment every day. You know, is when you wake up 10 minutes early, is when you, you know, finish that training session, you stand up and tie your belt. You know, my body, when I finish a workout, wants to stand up. My body does not want to sit down. And my body was taught that. You know, I taught that to my body. And when I do that, it gives me such a strength of mind because I know this is who I am. It's not a it's not a voice that I create, you know, it's in my subconscious already, you know? And then I look at my guys sometimes, I'm like, guys, if I'll be fighting against you, I'll be eating you guys alive because <laughs> I'll be like a hungry dog. Look at you on your knees with a, with like a, a body language that does don't want to be there. You know what I mean? And I always give the example when I fought Roger in 2008, um, you know, I, I visualize that, like I visualize, getting tired. I visualize Roger in front of me and the guy, you know, he has a big presence. The thing about Roger, more than his jiu-jitsu, I think, is his presence. You know, he walks around like, I'm just going to mount and choke everyone around me. <laughs> he has that. And if you yeah. feed into that, guess what? He's going to mount and choke you. So, you know what I mean? And, 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 and there was a moment in the fight that we, we broke off. And because I'm so used to tie my belt so fast, then I tie my belt and I'm a, I was super tired. You know, like, you know, when you want to sit down, but you don't want to sit down. Boom, I tie my belt. Now I'm like this and I see Hodge on the ground, like, whew, like he tied the first belt. Whew, and I'm like, come on, dude. Come on, dude. I'm like, <laughs> my arm. like, why is it taking so long? But I was dying on the inside. But I was trained for that. I was trained for that winning attitude. You know what I mean? Even though I was feeling. Okay, I could have an extra 20 seconds too. But I'm like, well, my 20 seconds and his 20 seconds, it could go bad for me because if that motherfucker recovers 20 seconds, I'm the one suffering. So I better just go <laughs> through the pain and appreciate the pain and see how it goes. You know, and I was able to not get my arm broken in the last second, but, you know, <laughs> <I did> this. <laughs> Yeah, it was awesome. And it, it sounds, I guess, like it's, you kind of, you said, but it's, it's a process, right? It takes time. Yeah. And I think that's an issue that you see, you kind of mentioned about the current generation, you know, needing kind of that gratification. But I think it's also the instant gratification as well, isn't it? Yeah. Where they want everything straight yeah, away. I'm not and... the Kobe Bryant quote, and I'm the champion. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. It, it's every day. Mm. If you don't put in action what you learn, you didn't learn anything. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is something that came a lot to me, like when people say a lot, but it, like when they don't do it. So uh, I did a, a, a ayahuasca uh, retreat in the beginning of the year. Right. Yeah. And uh, it was super beautiful ceremonies. I got a lot out of it. And I remember the one the one thing that I had in my mind is action is action. Like, why, why, why do I have that? Right. And uh, after the ceremonies, we always have you know, like meetings, right? To talk about what happened, if someone is feeling a certain way. And that was a situation that I, I'll be able to speak. And flat out, I'd say, say, guys, you know, we're about 70 people in the room. I'm like, it's beautiful that you guys are seeing, you know, whatever. You guys are seeing your, your past lives. But if you don't wake up next day and act upon it, it's useless. So whatever you feel put in action regardless. Otherwise there is no training. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, it's only on your mind. But if you don't actually exercise that every day, the goodness, 
whatever. Oh, I feel that uh, I shouldn't drink. Don't drink then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, I feel I should do this to my life. Call your friend. You know what I mean? So action, which is our one of our blades, attitude. Attitude is just basically our discipline in action. You know what I mean? And, and if you don't do that, you're not practicing. That's the best way. The best way to learn is to teach. You know what I mean? And I, and I think that's what, what needs to happen to this to this group, you know, of, mm. of, 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 of this generation. is putting everything that I actually believe in action, not into like words or, 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 or accusing people of things that are not just because they have an opinion and things like this. You know what I mean? I'm like, sometimes I'm like, oh, you're terrible. Ah, ah. I'm like, put a mirror on you. And actually yell to yourself, let me see if you think you're beautiful saying that. Mm. You know what I mean? So that, that's a big act, attitude problem, I think, with this generation. Yeah, 100%. We talked recently about motivation. And um, I think there's a, an idea that motivation comes out of nothing. And we talked that obviously taking action and, and kind of seeing the result of that action typically is what motivates people and keeps them doing it. So that's some great mm -hmm. advice there. I wanted to ask, actually, in regard to competing in absolutes and... and fighting bigger opponents obviously you're not a small man yourself but I'd like to hodge you to name to name one I was going to ask if you ever adapted your kind of game plan or your style or was it more about just mentality for you um well like I said I'm not the smallest guy um you know I think in that case specific case like yeah number one is believing you can beat Goliath right like that's always going to be right and, and Jiu Jitsu you know I would say more specific with the gi uh, than no gi. I think like no gi, it's very difficult for a smaller man to beat a bigger man because of the physicality involved. Um, you know, you just got to believe that jiu-jitsu is exactly why Ellie Grace is at. You know what I mean? Where the small man can beat the big man. Um, you know what I mean? I, I don't think it changed. You know, I knew I was I was in the, in the weight range where, you know, it was doable for me. But um, if you look at the people today, man, like Victor Hugo is humongous. You know, it got, uh, was the word gargantuous. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, like, like Bouchesha, he's gargantuous. You know what I mean? Like even Eric Muniz, he competes at, at, at super heavyweight, but he's seven foot tall. <laughs> it, it gets to a point that that theory goes goes down to the gutter you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. if you're not a super heavyweight get out of it you know what i mean for you to lose um you know of course we have may run now that 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 took third um you know what i mean on the on the, on the absolute you know what i mean i you know that that theory of the small man can be the big man it goes out the gutter when the big man has technique you know what i mean and then and it comes down again, and they will come down to mindset, right? To 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 energy. Uh, like uh, even when Gutenberg lost to uh, lost to John, saying you could see that his 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 life energy was going away. You know, there was nothing to do with. He's really good at jiu jitsu, but you could see that he stopped believing. He started believing that he could be beaten, and he got beaten. You know what I mean? So. Um, like I said, like like I remember when I trained with Bushesha one time, I'm like, man, fuck, man, fighting Bushesha with the gi would be terrible, <laughs> you know, because he's an athletic, fucking ripped, 260 pound dude, you know, like even when Victor decides to kind of move a little like more aggressive with me, I'm like, all right, bro, I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> um, but Hodger is a big man, but he's still. 100 kilos you know what i mean he's not like 112 kilos you know what i mean um but yeah i think the number one thing is is is, is training for that mm -hmm. um i think having training partners to that kind of size is kind of important nowadays it's just because it has evolved so much where we don't like i said we don't have big people we have gargantuous people you know what i mean we went from like sumo looking ultra heavyweights to like Bushesha looking heavyweights. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It, 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 like, imagine that judoka guy, the French guy. I saw this guy, that guy in a, I saw that guy in Brazil. I was like, dude, if this guy Uchimata's me, I'm going to die. You know what I <laughs> mean? But it's just being real, realistic, right? Oh, yeah, mindset, realistic. 
you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, but yeah, man, I think. But I also think open divisions. You you should always come to the idea of like, I'm just gonna beat Goliath. You know what I mean? And have fun doing it. You know what I mean? I think that's the best thing that a smaller person can do in an absolute. You know, I'm the smaller guy, nothing to lose. I'm gonna trick this guy and be the guy that tricks Goliath. You know, mm-hmm. I think like it doesn't change anything. I think, um, you know, I think of course if you are below middleweight, that's gonna be a problem for you. Yeah, I think some people are just built different, aren't they? As well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back in the day, how much sort of weight did you put into doing off the mat conditioning? So I know obviously you're notorious for your kettlebell training, and we've uh, we've had Cameron Shea on this podcast as well, and of course you're involved with Budokan as well. So how how important was was that sort of stuff for you competing over the years to to prep you for these big matches? Um, you know, like in my time, to tell the truth, conditioning wasn't a big thing. You know, uh, even today, I think conditioning in jiu jitsu is 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 how can I say? I don't think doing Olympic lifting will get your jiu jitsu better. Right. What gets jiu jitsu better is the jiu jitsu. If you cannot, if you cannot recreate the the equilibrium between your output of energy against your technique, you're still gonna get tired. Right. So I think it's very important. Um, so I think conditioning do two things to you: gives your body awareness, okay, and of course physiologically make you stronger. Okay, neurologically, whatever you want to go in that rabbit hole. All right. So I have always liked to do certain exercises that recreate somehow the type of strength that I need in a in a match. Why do I love kettlebells? Because everything about kettlebells is jujitsu. You know, I have to maneuver a twenty kilo tool with technique. With, with kindness, you know, because if I don't move with kindness and technique and, 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 and be more gentle with it, I'm going to get hurt. Uh, look at kettlebell swing. You can say the kettlebell swing is an arm lock. You could say the kettlebell swing is a, is a sprawl and also, you know, get your legs, your back. Is you standing up from the guard? You know what I mean? Is you standing up, for example. The rack position is you keep your elbows closed, but also – Build that strength and the flexibility to be able in that position. Uh, if you look at the jerk, you know the jerk is is the is the is the line of strength from feet to knees to hip. Like you throw a punch, like the line of uh, the kinetic energy that goes through maneuver something. You know what I mean? The Turks get up. It's the best jiu-jitsu exercise. You know what I mean? Like is the is the hipscape is the standing up from a from a from a from a you know a X guard or something like this or for that sake just. Turks get up someone out of our side control. <laughs> you know, I think that's extremely important. You know what I mean? But one mindset that I really don't like when people say, oh, man, I'm getting so tired in jiu-jitsu. I need to do conditioning. Well, you should first see if your technique is good. Maybe that's why you're getting tired. I remember when the whole social media stuff started and I would see a lot of my opponents doing a lot of conditioning, like a lot, like squatting three times the weight and I'm like doing air squats, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, that could be a problem. And they were getting more tired than I was, you know? Believe it or not, jiu-jitsu is still endurance. I think it's way more endurance than anything else as far as conditioning. Like, like I said, uh, whatever, a power clean, right? Can make you faster? Sure will make your tissue ready for faster tissue movements. But if you do not, if you not go there and do your uchikomis and do your double legs, you're not going to be fast. If your timing is off, you're wasting your energy, you know? So there's a lot involved with that. Uh, but as far as like, and then we go back to like expression, right? Expression means movement. So, uh, I have always loved movement. You know, I, I have always moved very well. I didn't even know, you know, because I was the smallest guy. Uh, I always believed 100 percent technique, but I always felt like, oh, I can move here. I always have that intuition. And then 
I remember my first yoga class, I was 17. I'm like, whoa. Like now I'm in this pose. I'm like, this is so uncomfortable. And I'm like, wow, that's jujitsu. Because in jujitsu, I have to be comfortable when I'm uncomfortable. How do I get comfortable here? And the guy breathes, like the whatever, the, the basica. I was like, okay. So I'm like, wow, those technologies are amazing. So now I can use that mindset and recreate the jujitsu. You know, and also I'm feeling strong and sexy because I'm doing all these positions and now I'm flexible and now I'm a bit flexible. I was like, that's cool. And then I start to see Gymnastica Natural at the time. And I remember he's doing those movements like, wow, this is like a normal plata. This is like, so I have always like thought with the Jiu Jitsu mind, you know, and but Gymnastica Natural, it became very fitness movement, right? This is how I jump. This is how I do this, right? But then, too bad for me, I found Budokan a little too late in my life. But is what really helped me to stay healthy at this stage of my life. You know, uh, I remember when I first did that class at Budokan, I'm like, oh my fucking God, this is my whole jiu-jitsu in three movements. You know, and I and I remember when 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 Cameron was doing his teacher training, we we're all the time talking that Melaine had been like, hey guys, we're doing a class here. You guys better stop talking about this. Because jujitsu is still an art form emotion. Is it still how you express yourself, right? So you can only know if your jujitsu is good if you can express that. Otherwise, it's just theory, right? So with Budokan. It's, it's expression, right? How do I, I can express this movement or that movement? How can I find, you know, the flow of waters, right? Is this movement match with that movement, the match with that movement? You know what I mean? And I think that's, that creates, that educates your body to be body intelligent. That's how I feel about movement and kettlebells, for example. It just makes your body more intelligent, you know? Because now you know how to construct movement and you, you know how to construct energy, you know, to, to, you know, to pop up, you know, your hip into a, into a swing or into a clean or into whatever you do with your kettlebell. You know what I mean? And also, like I said, you're fighting that bell for 10 minutes. You know, sometimes I hold that thing. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm fighting Kainan now. Okay. Now it's Bushesha, you know, and then you can have fun with it, you know, and that's how I feel about it. You know, it's about complementing what you are already doing, but it's useless if you cannot go back and apply in practice. I'll tell you something, man. If you just do bodybuilding, have a great cardio, and you know how to train properly, that's your conditioning right there. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be specific. Of course, um, there's a lot of people that I see, like, you know, particular movements. I think this is amazing. Uh, but if you cannot go back and recreate that within a practical combat movement, you know what I mean? I think it's a problem. I think if you don't, if you don't acquire intelligence and know how to apply that, it actually could hinder you more than can do good, you know, because yeah. I still think jujitsu is a very specific form of sport where there's a lot of energy outputs, right? Like, and that's the beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu. If you look at wrestling, for example, it's one or two. Explosion, asometrics, and a lot of strength. If you if you lack those three, you're not there, right? Just, just in, in a broad perspective. But in jiu-jitsu, there's resting positions, there's flexible positions, there's strength isometric situations, there is flexible strength situations where you have to move from like a stretching, like a Pilates type of idea. You know what I mean? There's the speed, there's the cardio, there's the mindset. So jiu-jitsu is a very interesting um, uh, sport in that sense because it requires all these different outputs of energy. Is that kinetic power? Is that isometrics? Is that speed? Like it, it could change so fast for the nature of the sport. You know, maybe judo will be the closest to it, uh, I would say. But uh, but even the way you train judo is a bit different than jiu-jitsu because you have to actually throw people, not just 
that little, you know, what jujitsu guys to take down, they throw them in the ground really easy. No, you, you need to throw people, you know, you need to go full on, like, you know, and, and, and feel that power, you know? And I think that's, that's what it is with jujitsu. Like, for example, like explosion in jujitsu, unless it's a takedown, I don't think you explode at all. You know, I don't think there's any technique in jujitsu that require an explosion. I'm just going to bat unless it's a takedown, right? Uh, you can argue a bump, maybe a bump will be the most explosive movement you can do in jujitsu if someone's on the top of you. But besides that, if you don't apply movement, if you don't move and you, you don't do technique, all that that lift goes to the gutter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And you mentioned, uh, obviously, your, you have uh, your six blades, jiu-jitsu school now. And you mentioned one of the blades being, I think, discipline earlier. Tell us what the other yeah. five are. There's a, a family, respect, honor, loyalty, attitude, and discipline. This is, this is what they mean, uh, each one of them. But, of course, dedication. You can, you can go around and, and play with it. Um, it was an interesting story with that because, uh, you know, we started, you know, the old jiu-jitsu way, you put your initials on it, uh, and they evolved to Ibero jiu-jitsu. And then uh, we told a guy, hey, can you get us a logo, how it goes? And then they say, hey, I brought it. I, I have the Japanese influence, um, uh, you know, kind of like a pinwheel thing. I'm like, oh, it's a pinwheel, you know? And then we're like, oh, we love this, you know? And then we we, we start to adopt that. And then we, of course, we... we um, we trademarked it, but there's actually there's another restaurant that actually uses the same logo. Um, but uh, because it came from Japan, I don't think you can actually trademark it. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so yeah, I start with that, and then uh, Saul and I we always compare like the bushido, right? So people lost the bushido along the way because I can I can hate you as a samurai, but I'm always gonna keep the the ethics between you and I in a combat. You know what I mean? Uh, I was even watching this uh, uh, this fun, I think it was a cartoon of a samurai. And the samurai wanted to beat this other samurai so bad. He wanted to kill him because he killed someone in his family. But there was a moment that the samurai, the other samurai was hurt from battling another guy. And the other samurai, man, I'm so pissed that I cannot beat you now. I'm going to wait until you is stronger so then I can beat you. But you're talking about life and death. He could just go and kill the guy. It's like, no, I'm going to wait you to recover because I want to have a fair battle with you. You know, and that says a lot. You know what I mean? The way the, way the behavior was back in the day. Mm -hmm. So when the logo came in, we're like, well, this is maybe that could be our Bushido, right? And then we go like, all right, bro. Like with Sal and I, we're talking. Uh, I don't really remember how it started. But uh, uh, there's one of uh, this, this old that pay spirit of the samurai. So he always kind of had those analogies in our lives. Uh, and they were like, all right, you know, we're family, right? Okay, we're family. Let's, let's start with family. You know, and then like, all right, what's, what's number one that we have to go with each other as a family? Oh, we got to respect each other, okay? Respect martial arts. You know, you've got to have that. And then, of course, honor. Say, okay, let's honor our name and our word. You know, if a man doesn't have his word, you know, like I said, the honor to like do things right and, and, and have ethics and things like this. And then loyalty, you know, and then uh, that loyalty is a very interesting subject because everything people that loyalty is to a person. Right. I always think that loyalty is to the principles that you care, you know, like when a guy said, oh, you know, you guys have been not loyal to ADCC. I'm like, look, you know, some people are being loyal to other things right for them. You know what I mean? I think we need to respect that. See, it goes back to, to respect, you know. Uh, and then attitude, I think, like I said, attitude is just putting in actions everything you believe, such as maybe like a positive attitude towards something. Because I think what changes a lot of the start of a mindset is your attitude towards something. You know, what's your attitude towards a hardship? Are you a victim or are you someone that prevails under it, Right. And then the base of everything is discipline. You know what I mean? Discipline, discipline, discipline. You got to have discipline to be able to do all of it. You know what I mean? Otherwise, you know, you're talking about motivation. You know, motivation can get you started, but what makes you finish is discipline. You know what I mean? And that and that's how the whole idea uh, came about, um, you know, naming the blades. Uh, and then uh, 
we didn't call the blades actually you know uh we are when the whole instagram came in and the hashtag like kind of thing came about uh and i had a thing with Saul. i said Saul, is this like a like a crest like a like a family crest right like a logo is this a logo is a pinwee when we started to argument what it was you know like 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 nike that is swoosh you know, and then uh, me and my uh, photographer, she came to me. Those are the blades. I'm like, well, yeah, the six blades. And that was very catchy. You know what I mean? The six blades, the six blades, six blades. And then, um, you know, we did number six. So we had like students tattooing six blades. <laughs> nice. super cool. Everyone, you know, got the idea that Hiberu Jiu-Jitsu had their, you know, their, their values, right? The, the, the pillars, right? I don't, I don't think they're valid. They're more pillars than anything else. Uh, yeah, and then uh, and then we start with that, and then um, you know Saul decided to retire. He wanted to do something else, and then I told him, I say, um, I think Hibero, of, of course, is our legacy. I think our style of jujitsu is Hibero uh, at this point, but it's a very difficult brand even in America because people don't know how to write it. Uh, Ribero, like some people misspell it a lot, uh, and things like this. And, and, and I felt that Six Blades, uh, like I said, it's almost called Nike Swoosh. But, it again, it's a catch name. And ours is a bit easier when you go in America. You know, I still have to, like, every time I buy something, I have to get the number six and the letter six and the, and the, and the, and the written six. Uh, but I, I thought was something I really truly believe was something that was created within it. I just didn't come up like, oh, right, I was going to call this. You know what I mean? So it just made sense for us. And, uh, you know, we are, we basically rebranded all the schools. Um, you know, I just, I'm always up to date what's happening with marketing, um, with, with, with everything. But in the end, um, it is a bit, is it operational, right? We have a couple of things different than a lot of people do. Uh, we're not so square as far as like, you have to do this. I, I'm not the person that like to go and say you have to do this. Um, we're still a team. Uh, we have like mastermind groups. I'm finished the methodology, like the like a platform where people can see things. You know, it is still educational. It's still martial arts. You know, and I think uh, you know it's just beautiful to be able to to create something that that help people. Uh, like I said, create. Uh, a way of living, creating something that can rely upon and, 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 and be with a family. You know, for me, it's about what my athletes, my students, or someone that wants opportunity with six blades can do to raise a family, you know, to raise a good citizenship, citizens, and, uh, you know, and live their real lifestyle. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people, I think, they teach too much, they do too much, uh, they, they hold on to control, and that sometimes hinders them to actually live the lifestyle. You know, we call jiu-jitsu a lifestyle, but if you want the academy, 60 hours a week, that is not a lifestyle. You know what I mean? That's that's a prison. You know, and that's usually, you know, things that we do because especially within the association, we want people to travel. We want people to come here to Austin and, 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 and train. So I have to help them uh, structure their, their life in that sense so they have the financial – uh, attributes and the financial possibilities to travel, to take their families in vacations, because I think that's 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 what I'm striving for. I want them to through jujitsu to to live a life worth living. Yeah, absolutely love that, mate. And if people want to find you, where where, where do they do that? Well, sixblades.com is our website. Uh, I'm not really opening any any associate affiliations now. Uh, I'm only getting people that either I know. Uh, but if you want to go, even, you know, my Instagram, I try as much as I can to be personal, at least in the first approach and, and things like this. Uh, usually I ask people, why do you want to be in association? You know what I mean? I go to the perspective. I'm going to say I go to the perspective that I don't want to, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. way. but but also it needs to be something that 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 is beneficial for both. But also, are you coming here because you just want to carry a brand or you want to put the work in? A lot of people, they want to be part of a team, but they're not willing to to put the work in. And I think sometimes it's a problem, you know. But, uh, but yeah, man, like sixblaze.com, sixblaze Austin, uh, you want to come and visit me, 
open doors policy, come as you are. You know what I mean? I don't have this thing like a uh, certain, no, if you have a Gracie Ba Alliance, whatever, check Matt Gi, wear your Gi. Uh, I respect people's schools so much. I don't have this thing like you're in my school, you got to wear my thing. No, just, just come in as you are. Um, you know, open doors policy 100% of the time. I love teaching. Uh, I will spend the time in the mats with you as much as possible. But yeah, sixblades.com, sixblades Austin. Uh, you guys can go me in my Instagram. You know, if it doesn't go in the request for too long, uh, <laughs> I try to be as personal as, a, as possible can. Um, but yeah, it's uh, life is good, man. Just uh, just uh, one white better time. Yeah. Zandi, we really enjoyed this conversation, mate. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Lovely to meet you. Thank you, mate. Well, thank you, guys. And uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to me. Uh, say hi to your audience. Thank you so much. Although you're around the world, uh, you know, listen to us. And uh, hopefully I can see you guys, you know, in your country and then go there and hang out, have fun. Yeah, and you guys, if you guys have an awesome Texas, uh, please come by. Yeah, we will do. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.